I'm thankful to be the preacher, but boy, am I ever thankful to be a part of you. I consider myself a part of this church family, and I hope you feel that same way about me as I do about you, because we have such a great, strong church family here. This is a special place. I hope you know that. This is a really special church, and I hope that you feel as connected as I do uh, with this church uh, that you feel so such a great obligation and also a great opportunity to serve the Lord through this church. And I just think this is a wonderful place, and I want to remind you about how good you are. Several weeks ago, Matthew and I started a series of lessons, uh, and what we've been talking about are great things. Not here together, but also I was so thankful that we were able to live stream it and people were able to look at it all over the world, really. And so that's a wonderful thing. There's no doubt in my mind for sure after seeing and listening to that lesson and seeing the way that Matthew presented it of how to attain salvation. It's obvious in the Bible. Make it so complicated that people won't even be able to obey it. That would be ridiculous. We serve such a loving God, and He's going to lay something out very simply for us to understand. And I'm so excited to be able to piggyback off of what Matthew has to say this morning when we talk about our salvation and how it is an assured thing. It's a wonderful assurance. We sang blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I think this is an appropriate time to talk about this because all my life I've heard people say these kind of things. Boy, I, I really hope that I make it to heaven. I really, boy, you know, I, I, the chance that we can get to go to heaven, boy, I hope I make it. I hope that I can get there. And I think that's okay to say. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to say. But I also know that the Bible teaches us that we don't have to hope as if it just might be. We don't have to think, well, am I going to make it or not? I don't know. We don't have to feel that way. I want to present to you this morning and help you understand and help you be excited about your salvation because it is a sure thing if you've touched the blood. If you obey what Matthew presented to us last week, you have no worries. No worries whatsoever. You see, this is blessed assurance that your salvation is a sure thing. It's a lot different. You know, sometimes people wonder, what is the difference between assurance and insurance? Sounds very similar. Well, insurance is a little bit different. Let me tell you, insurance is a practice or arrangement right from the a dictionary, okay? I just Google it, you can come up with this. A, set, a practice or arrangement by which a company or government agency provides a guarantee of compensation for specified loss, damage, illness, death in return for a payment of a premium. A thing providing protection against a possible eventuality. There's a big difference between that and assurance. You know, insurance, I'm familiar with insurance. I, I've had to make a few claims in my life. When I was a teenager, I think I wrecked just about every vehicle that I had, okay? Uh, even when I first was driving, uh, th this lady one time actually just came out and cut across a parking lot and T-boned my vehicle, and so we had to make some kind of an insurance claim. And then one time when I was a junior in high, or a senior in high school, the very beginning of the year, uh, I was really busy. I was involved in band, and I was involved in my rock band. Yeah, the preacher was in a rock band in high school. I could really thump the bass, let me tell you. 
So I was in a rock band, I was in the regular band, and I had school going on, and I, and I had a job, and my dad told me earlier that week, he said, Alex, you need to really make sure that you're resting well enough because you're gonna, something bad is going to happen if you're not careful. And boy, dad was right. After working you know, all throughout the week and going to school, the, the band uh, marched Friday night in Searcy, and then my rock band had a gig. Yeah, that's right, I said gig. <laughs> we had a gig the next day on Saturday, and so we were really busy and just going everywhere. And I had to work and open up this grocery store that I was working at in the morning. And by that Saturday night, I was exhausted. And dumb old Alex gets in his vehicle and I turn the heat on and I put my cruise control and I'm taking home. Boom, I'm falling asleep. I cross the line, I go into a ditch, and I wake up driving like this in the ditch. I hit this pole where I come back down and I and uh, lay, lay on the front part of the vehicle and wreck that truck. It hurt my feelings so bad. We make an insurance claim, right? My senior year, I had to drive my mom's kit Toyota camera to school. Not nearly as cool as my truck was, all right? Well, then I go off to college and I, I have another vehicle. My dad gives me a Toyota uh, Tacoma and he has me take over the payments and I'm driving to Colorado. And then there's this, I think I told this last week in Bible class, I had a a, a five-car pileup in a snowstorm on I-25 right outside of Denver. Wrecked that vehicle. Another insurance claim. I know, it's crazy. There I am, a thousand miles away from home, and had to come home, and then I get my life back together, I guess you could say, and don't wreck that anymore vehicle. Oh, wait, there's one more that I wrecked, of course. Uh, then I was driving from Judsonia to Heber Springs, and I worked in this lumber yard where my dad was working, and road was slick and I wrecked the vehicle into the ditch and we lost that uh, Nissan Xterra. I know it's crazy. I think I could list 11 vehicles that I had in my life. I know insurance, okay? I've made a lot of claims on insurance. This, what we're talking about this morning, is not that, okay? That's the point that I want to make to you. See, it's, it's the possibility, all right? Insurance is not the same thing as assurance. Assurance is a positive declaration intended to give confidence, a promise, confidence or, I love this, certainty in one's own ability. And it's not the ability of the Christian, it's the ability of Jesus and that he died on the cross to redeem you, shed his blood for your forgiveness. And it is a sure thing. It is confidence. It is absolutely a promise, and it is for certain that you can have this salvation, and you can attain it and hold on to it for your whole life. You can do this. That's what assurance is. You know, a lot of times, though, we think, well, you know, God, am I so sure in my salvation that I don't even need to concern myself with it? No, not at all. Do you need to look at yourself and examine yourself? Absolutely. You need to do that all the time. We need to do that on a daily basis. Matter of fact, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, he says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, okay? Or do you not recognize this, this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless, indeed, you fail the test. See, it's a, you've got to retest yourself constantly. I hate tests. I'm a terrible test taker. I hate them very much. This kind of test, I have to just go ahead and buckle down and do it. And my whole life is a studying for this test. My whole life I'm studying for it. I'm constantly going to go ahead and look at myself and examine myself to see if I'm in the faith. That's what I need to do. And once I do, if I fail the test, then I need to re-examine myself again and get back in the faith. All right? So assurance is not something that you say, well, I'm assured of salvation and I don't have anything I need to do about it. No, you need to keep on examining yourself. But the problem sometimes is, is that Christians take that to the other extreme. And we say, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can make it. And we sit there, maybe at the bottom of our bed, with our heads in our hands, and we ask questions like, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Well, the answer is no, you're not. But you serve a God who is good enough. Who is good enough. We may ask questions like, 
do I do enough? Well, the answer is no. There's not an amount that you can do in order to assure your salvation. You can't, you can't be good enough, and you can't do enough. But you serve a God who is enough. And he takes care of both of those questions. And so when you sit there at the edge of your bed, and you think, am I good enough? The answer is no, but God is. Do I do enough? No. I can always do more. But God has done enough. When he sent his son on the cross, he shed his blood once and for all. And that's the beauty of it. This morning I want us to look at assurance. Look at this definition again. You can be confident. You can trust in this promise. And you can know for certain. And that's the three points that we're looking at this morning. Salvation is a sure thing. I want us to see that you can be confident. I want us to see that we can trust the promise. I want us to know that we can know for certain. You can know for certain about your salvation. It's not a guessing game. You don't have to roll the dice and say, well, boy, I hope I'll make it to heaven. No. You can know for certain. You can trust the promise. You can absolutely be confident. Look at this passage as we look at being confident. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. He says, I thank my God in my, all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in, your view of, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And Paul says, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I love this because Paul knows these Philippians. He knows them very, very well. He remembers Lydia, and he remembers that Philippian jailer who was about to kill himself. And he remembers establishing this church in Philippi, a beautiful, beautiful picture of this church that's being established and how these people are giving their lives over to Jesus. And the Philippian jailer, he takes his whole household and they become Christians. And so Paul then says, listen, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you and I am so confident because I was there the day that you obeyed the gospel. I was there and so your participation in the good news of Jesus Christ and the fact that you obeyed the gospel you were buried with him in baptism. Your sins were washed away. I am confident of it. And if Paul is confident, we can be confident too. He says this. He says that he who began a good work in you, he will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's the assurance of salvation. He's going to perfect it. He brings it to maturity. He makes it absolutely complete. It is not a guessing game. And if Paul can be confident in the participation in the gospel of those Philippians, you need to know, too, that you can be confident in your participation in the gospel as well. When you obey the gospel and your sins are washed away, you don't have to come out of that water thinking, boy, I hope I made it to, I make it to heaven. No, because you... chapter 15, that he delivered to them as of first importance that which you heard, that's what, that what you believe, that's what you, you were saved by, in which you stand. He says, resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to Scripture. That's what it is. So when you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you're representing the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And it is at the death where Jesus' blood was spilled. And so when you are baptized, you're touching the blood. You're touching the blood. And when you touch the blood, you can have great confidence in your salvation. You can have great confidence. Now let's look at another one here. You can trust the promise. You can trust the promise. The first Christians, the first Christians in Acts chapter 2, are told to trust the promise. They're told to trust the promise. Peter says to them, starting in verse 38, he says, repent, they ask, what do we do about the sin in our life? Verse 37, what shall we do? Peter responds, repent 
And let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call to himself. That promise that Peter talks about is for you and it's for me. That promise of the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit is not just for those people who are hearing it on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He tells them that this promise is for your children, their biological children, and for those who are far off. I love that part because that includes me. I was far off, not just physically far off in another part of the, of the world. Geographically, I'm far off from where he preached it, but I'm also a far off time-wise. That was over 2,000 years ago. And here he says, a far off this promise is for you. Then he says, for as many as the Lord will call to himself. As many as people that will listen, people that will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and obey it. Those people, that promise is for you as well. And you can trust it. You can trust that promise. It's for you too. It's a, it's a, a sure thing. It's salvation assurance. Now let's look at this last one here. You can know for certain. Know for certain. Second Peter chapter, two, chapter 1 and verse 10, Peter writes and says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. He says, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Ooh, I love it when the Bible gives me such absolutes like this. Because if the Bible says it, you will never stumble. Boy, that means something. That means something. But what's the condition of this never stumbling? Well, he says, as long as you practice these things, as long do exactly what the scriptures tell me, I can know for certain. And I call. Remember, he's calling and he's choosing you because you're going to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That promise was for you. And so he's called you. He's making certain of it. And you can know it for sure. As long as you practice those things, you will never stumble. If you'll choose to do what is right, if you'll choose to live according to the scriptures, that promise is, is that you will never stumble. You'll never stumble. There's no doubt in my mind, if you'll follow the directions, you'll, it'll turn out right for you. You'll follow the directions. Follow the directions and you'll get there. Do what's right. You will never stumble. Never stumble. Now I want to share a couple more passages with you to sum this up this morning. We've read this one already. Jesse read it for us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. I love this one here because this one really teaches me that I don't have to sit there and wonder if I'm going to have eternal life. I don't have to sit there and wonder about it. He says, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. And He who has the Son Life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. Now this whole year we've been talking about our life in Christ. Well, here it is, folks. Here it is. These things I have written you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. It's not something you have to say, that, well, you, you know, I believe and I've obeyed. I, I'm going to do what's right. I really just don't know. No, John says, I've written this for you who believe. Now, I think, I may be going out on a limb here, but I think probably 99.9% .9 of you in this audience this morning believe. I think so. I think you at least believe that God exists. I think you at least believe that God is the creator of the world. I think you believe that Jesus Christ is his son and that he came to this earth and died. I think that's true. Now, you have to act on that. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. You need to act on that belief because that's what belief really is. It's a trust and obey. And that's what Matthew talked about last week. That belief is trusting and it's obeying. And when you trust and you obey, you can know that you have 
eternal life. It is not by chance that you make it to heaven. No. It is outlined perfectly in the plan of God that if you do what He is asking you to do and you follow His commands, you will know for certain that you have eternal life and you'll be able to attain it and have it. And it's a sure thing. Let's look at another one. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This is one of my favorite. Paul says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I love this one because it's, again, an absolute. There is zero. How much condemnation? Zero. In other words, will I be condemned to hell if I'm in Christ Jesus? Absolutely not. If you are in Christ, there is absolutely zero percent chance that you will go to hell. You understand me? If you are in Christ, His grace is sufficient, His blood is sufficient, His death on that cross is an absolute thing, and if you have touched the blood, there is absolutely no doubt that you're going to get to heaven. No doubt whatsoever. No doubt. You can make it. No condemnation for those that are in Christ. Now, the thing is, you need to be in Christ. Well, what does that mean? John writes and says this in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. He says, For if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we are in Christ, there is no condemnation. If we are in the light as He Himself is in the light, that tells me that I'm having fellowship with Jesus. And guess what? When I'm having fellowship with Jesus and you're having fellowship with Jesus, we're having fellowship with Jesus all together in the light. And that's what the church really is. And if we're in the church and if we are in the light and we are in Christ, then the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. This word cleanses is so important. Matthew alluded to this last week and he talked about words in the King James Version. And how in the King James, when there's this T-H at the very end of words, that means that it's a continual action. And you'll find that here in this verse. This cleanses us from all sin. In other words, it's a continual cleansing. As long as we are in the light and we have fellowship with Jesus and we have fellowship with, uh, with each other, we are constantly touching the blood of Jesus. You have nothing to worry about. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Because when you're in Christ, you're continually being cleansed by His blood. You're continually touching His blood. Constantly. And there is no doubt in my mind that you have eternal life. One more here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 and 29. He says, for all of you who have been baptized into Christ. See the, the, the correlation here? You've got to be baptized. The world will tell you, well, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. The world's going to say, you just need to believe in Jesus. You need to say a prayer to Him. Admit that you're a sinner. And once you believe, you're saved. You don't have to be baptized. Listen, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. He says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are of Abraham's descendants and heirs according to promise. Oh, that's what what it is. I get something special. I get a promise. I am an heir to something. Why? Because I've been baptized into Christ. I'm in Christ. There's no condemnation. The blood is continually cleansing me. And then when that is all happening, then I'm going to get a piece of that promise. Now, what is this promise that that Paul's talking about? This according to promise. Well, this promise goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 17, where God promises to Abraham. And he says, the promise, or he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish, I love this part, my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an ever lasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. 
Now, when, when God makes this promise, Abraham, he's obviously promising the physical land of the Jews. He promised them that land, the land of Canaan. But this has a deeper promise for us as well because this promise extends to us. It is not just a promise for Abraham and his descendants, but it, this verse tells us that it is an everlasting covenant, a guarantee, a promise to all the descendants, and that's, that's you and I. We get to be a part of that. And to me, I can take this, and it almost, well, it teaches me that this land that he's talking about is not just the land over in Palestine. It's, it's not just talking about Jerusalem. Okay, to those, pe those Jews, that's what it was talking about. But that promise, that covenant, is also about the promise of eternal life for all of Abraham's descendants. We sing this VBS song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right side. I won't do the, all the motions or anything, but... You get the idea. We are a part of that great promise. and We're going to have that wonderful land that God has prepared for us. Jesus says He's preparing a place for us in John chapter 14. Where He is, we can be also. That's the promise that's given to us. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Salvation assurance. Here's the thing, folks. You can be confident. You can trust the promise. And you can know for certain about your salvation. No longer say, boy, I hope I make it to heaven. No. You say, I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I've touched the blood of Jesus. And His blood continually cleanses me from all of my sin. We're going to make it. We're going to make it, folks. We can do it. Now, here's the thing. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you've not touched the blood, you don't have any assurance whatsoever. None. I'm sorry. Just as much as there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ, for those that are outside of Christ, there is 100% condemnation for you. Absolutely. Either you're in Christ or you're outside of Christ. And the only way, the only way to get in Christ is touch the blood. Where's the blood? It's at His death. Remember, He died on the cross. It's at, it's at His death. How do I get to his death? I reenact it in baptism. I have my sins washed away in his blood. I'm buried with him in baptism and I'm raised to walk a new life. Then you can have the assurance of salvation. If you don't have it, boy, now is the time. Now is it. Because you know what? We're not promised the next one minute of our lives. Not promised. We're not promised tomorrow. And so if you don't have the assurance of your salvation, you need to respond right now. Come, let's together we stand.